Go. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we're going to be having some fun in here working with a blind wedged tenon. Um, and I'll be explaining what that is here in a moment. Um, but it's kind of like the wedge tenon we had earlier, except for it doesn't go all the way through the block. So how in the world do we get the wedges in? Um, we're going to have a little bit of fun with that. Uh, but before we get going on that, we're going to do a few announcements. If you are new to Wood by Wright, we do a live every Tuesday and uh, we record it so you can watch it after afterwards. Uh, so if you have any questions or things that come up you'd like answered, go ahead and throw them in the chat. My wife is there. And if you are watching this recorded, then uh, you can actually uh, look down in the description down below and there are timestamps by all of the questions. So you can actually read through all of the questions and jump to that section in the video. So if that's something you're looking for, hope that helps you out. Uh, we will be doing giveaways just like normal. We did a giveaway um, last week for two strops, and we're going to be giving away two strops again this week. Uh, and let's see, the, uh, the winner for watching recorded uh, was Robbie Rutherford. And uh, congratulations to you. I actually talked to him a little earlier today when I picked, and that should be going out to you tomorrow. Um, so we'll be giving away one for those who are live and then one for people who watch it recorded. Okay, but you have to tell them how many miles you ran last year. Oh, yes. Um, the, the question was, how many miles did I run last year? And the answer was 1,780-something-ish. Uh, <laughs> um, and so the, the two closest guesses were um, one person, I think it was 1,500 miles, <laughs> and one person had 2,000 miles. And I was pretty close to halfway, but I was just a little bit closer to 2,000 miles. So uh, congratulations. Um, yes, so 1,700 miles. I'm hoping to break 2,000 this year. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so upcoming events. I'm going to be at the Midwest Tool Collectors Meet here in Loves Park. Um, actually, I'm in McChesney Park right now. Loves Park's the next town over. Um, I don't know why I'm getting picky about that, but it's on uh, April they know. 14th, I believe it is. And it's like two miles away from me. So this is the, the big one for me. Uh, it's one of the smaller events. It's a local event, but a lot of fun. And so I'm looking forward to seeing any of you there. Feel free to come up and say hi. I will also be at the First National in Peoria. And I'll actually be doing a talk at that one. So I'm looking forward to that. If you don't know what the Midwest Tool Collectors is, is the best place to buy hand tools. It's also the best place to find out about hand tools and find out their history and talk to people who collect them and that type of thing. Um, there's a link to it down below if you want to see that. Oh, and then we will be at Makers Central in, uh, in May 11th, 12th, something like that, um, in, in England. So my wife and I will both be flying over there for that. So if I'm looking forward to meeting many of you who uh, don't get to see us at the, uh, the USA, USA events, we'll be getting over there. Anything I'm missing from notes? <coughs> Other than my wife is still sick. This is like, what, three weeks in a row? I don't know. I'm ready so, to be done. Uh, cut her some slack when she's coughing. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so let's actually look at what the wedged tenon is. And I didn't put this one together because once I put it together, you can't see anything. It just looks like one block running into another and it just looks like that. Um, so I wanted to actually show you this before we actually go into cutting it. So I'm, I'm showing the end before we get there. So this should be kind of interesting. Um, oh, no, I can't remove. So is it a... Spoiler alert? Yes, yes. Spoiler alert, <laughs> except for I'm showing it. So. Um, so let's switch over to that one. Uh, a, let's put that on two. Right? Cool. There, got it right. Brain isn't working with me. So normally with a wedge tenon, you put the wedge through, and when it sticks out the other side, <laughs> then you put in your wedges, and that splits it out. But in this case, it's a closed mortise, so just like a standard oh. mortise and tenon, so how exactly do you go about getting, oops, in the wrong way. How exactly do you go about getting the wedges in when this is slid in place? And some people say that this is a, a glueless joint so you can do this without glue. Um, I don't know if I would ever do it without glue because there is expansion and contraction that can loosen it up over time. But uh, for the most part, um, you can do it without glue, but I would generally do these um, glued. So you put these tins, you put them in there and they have to be the right size so that they actually slide down in. Oh no, did I not make them the right size? No, oh, mine are a little fat. So let's actually clean these up a little bit before we go any further. And there's a bunch of ways of doing it, but my fastest way is just grab a plane and plane them down. Just make sure you don't hit your finger. But after a few passes, you get them down to the size that they fit in there. That's one thing I forgot to check before doing this. Make sure that they fit. <laughs> 
see that one works that one works so now we can put these in here slide them down into the joint and then when you drive this down in those wedges will then wedge up into the the whole uh, socket so let me grab my mallet and tap 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 And so now, theoretically, those wedges have driven up into the tenon, and this is locked in place. So no matter how much yanking and moving, I'm, I'm, eventually I would be able to wiggle it a little bit, and I'd be able to compress the fibers and pull it around. But right now, that is an integral joint. There's actually a dovetail shaped inside. So I'm going to cut this off, and we're going to make the whole thing over here and show you some of the specificities that go into making a, uh, a wedged blind tenon. So it looks... Just like two blocks going together, this is very common in uh, Japanese furniture, so that they can hide the joinery. You don't see anything, but it's a very, very solid joint um, for just something so small like that. So let me cut this apart, and uh, we'll get on to doing this again, or for the first time. Any questions before I uh, dive into this? Anyone saying anything off the top? Okay. So let's cut this. <laughs> I don't care exactly where I'm cutting this because it's just for demonstration's sake. Ooh. Stopped early. Uh oh, someone did a super chat. Oh. And when there's a super chat, there's Need a dad joke. A dad joke. Who is it? Yeah. Alan. Alan. What do you call an alligator who works in Wall Street? An investigator. Who works on Wall Street? Yes, because he invests. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that one was especially exceptionally good. An no, no. I think Alan had a better one in the comments. Oh, what did Alan say? Okay, hang on. I gotta go back and find <laughs> it. His was um, you shouldn't kiss anyone on January first because it's only the first date. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Okay, so let's start off by making a tenon in the end of this. So this is our end of our board that we want to put into there. Um, and I'm going to do this just like I do with any other. I'm going to take my mortise and gauge, and this is one that I can get from Harbor Freight. Um, oop, cheapy, but works fairly well, and I've had it for years now, and it's still working fine. Um, and to pick the width of the tenon, I'm going to use the width of my mortising chisel so that my tenon and the mortise are the same size and I'm going to lay out on the board how wide my chisel is exactly and then I can put the pins of the mortising gauge into those two marks that I just created making sure that my marks are exactly the same. It's, I find this a lot easier to do than trying to match the pins up to the board uh, matching pins up to the chisel I find that easier doing than matching this up and then trying to set the fence the right spot my wife's you laughing should, again. You should have paid better, more for a better joke. <laughs> how much woodworker do you? How much modern woodworker you need to change a light bulb? Okay, German woodworker. <laughs> oh. So let's pick the depth of this. How far down do we want to go Sorry. through? And so let's go something around like uh, a little bit more than three quarters, something around seven eighths of an inch. I really don't care what it is. I'm not picky on this one. And I need to make a stop depth mark all around this before I actually start laying anything out. Where did I put my square? Oh, there it is. So we're going to trace around this, always making sure you reference off the same side and the same edge. So here I'm referencing off of this <coughs> edge. I'm going to roll it up over and I'm referencing off of this face. So you can cut there. And then I roll it this way. I still want to reference off of this edge that I referenced before. I'm going to flip this over. This way I can make sure that my lines all come together. Am I a little fuzzy? Well, wait, wait, wait. Which camera are you trying to be on? Oh, I'm on the side? Ah! That would be the problem. Uh, sorry about that. There, now you can see what I'm referencing on here. And then I'm going to roll it one more time. So I'm still referencing off the same <laughs> face that I referenced off earlier. Uh, now, here's where you need to pull out all the jokes about the uh, cigarette brands my wife uses. Yep. <laughs> Oop, wrong way. Put that back around there. And now we can draw all of our lines down to that depth mark that we just made on there. 
So across the top, from that depth mark up, from the depth mark up. And then to come in, I have another marking gauge that is just set at some random amount, about a quarter inch or so. So we can go there, there, and there. And we'll do the same thing on this side. When you get to a stopping point, I have a couple of questions. Okay, go for it. Um, let's see, Eagle Rico asked, how do you pull it out if you need to reset the joint? You can't. Once it's in, it's in. Um, this, is a, this is a permanent joint. Once it's in, it's done. Um, so don't put it in until you're ready to put it in. Uh, for dry fitting, you just put it in without the wedges, and it slides in and out like a regular tenon. Uh, but once it's in with those wedges, it's locked. That piece is not coming out of there without um, hurting something. Um, so now that we have this in place, it's ready to start cutting. And I'm going to back up this a little bit so that we can actually see this work. I'm going to grab my tenon saw. And we're actually going to cut tenons with a tenon saw, ripping down the face. And I start on the far side here, and I'm pinching with this. That's allowing my thumb to push it back and forth to the right mark, nicking it in. And then I'm going to lower my heel and bring it all the way across that line so that I can see where I'm at. And I find it easier to cut only on my side. So I'm going to cut all the way down at an angle here until I can see everything on my side. And then I can turn around and cut everything on the other side. That way I'm only cutting on the line that I'm watching and I can guide it a little bit easier. Down the line. Uh-oh. My light fell over. Oh well. Put that down. So then we're gonna do the same thing on this side. Any questions while I'm cutting these out? Uh, yes, Tim Barbecue said, can you cut the joint in half so we can see the taper spread inside the joint? That's actually a really smart idea. I will do that in a little bit here. Okay. If I don't do that by the end, remind say, me. Remind him if he does. <laughs> Just like that. Now, if I really trusted my saw and I trusted what I was doing, I'd just cut that down flat. But I find it easier to flip this around, do the exact same thing on this side, and make sure that I'm following the line on this side. It gives me a really nice clean cheek of the, uh, the tenon. And once I'm at an angle here, then I flatten it out and cut it all the way down the line. Down the line here, down the line there. Repeat it again on this side. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Tyler Wetbib asked, I was wondering how much the traditional plane was. I think he's in The traditional plane? That's all it says. Uh, ask further. Are you asking how much my number four is I just had? It says, I'm um, new to carving and what, and just wondering on how, wondering how much on of the traditional plane was. I don't know. I don't know what plane you are okay. referring to. How much is a traditional plane? Um, are you referring to a number four like this one? In which case, uh, this one I picked up for, I think I paid like six or seven bucks for it and completely restored it, repainted it, cleaned everything up on it. Uh, there's a crack in here that the previous owner glued back together askew, which kind of drives me crazy, but oh well. Um, but. Usually you can get a restored one for 40 or 50 bucks, but you can buy them rusted and needing some work for uh, five, 10 bucks, depending upon where you find them. Now I do the same thing cutting down this way. Except for in this case, it's so thin, it's just easier to cut both sides down. <coughs> just trust your saw to cut straight, straight across. And at this point, it really doesn't matter if I'm following any lines, because I'm going to make the mortise whatever this tin is, as long as I'm cutting straight down. And now we can cut the shoulders, so we have our cheeks and our shoulders. And yeah, any other questions? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, let me do this over on this side, let me give you a better camera view. Well, I do that. Oop, up a little farther. There we go. There, that'll be better for the camera. I like being cameraman oh. and 
user. And I'm going to use my carcass saw. Carcass saw is a smaller back saw um, with cross-cut teeth on it. Usually designed for cutting the, out the carcass of a uh, piece of furniture. Put you down. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to do the same thing here. Follow across. But in this case, I'm just going to keep the saw vertical. And cut slowly here as I'm getting close to the bottom. Waiting for those pieces just to fall off. And right from here, I'm going to make sure that everything is nice and clean and ready for work. So I'm just going to pare down a little bit. And some people like to undercut here, which I often do. Oop. So I should put that in the vise a little bit better. Um, in this case, I'm not going to undercut it right now. I just have this little extra in the corner that the saws didn't quite meet. So I'm going to get that out. Make sure that that's nice and clean. Just like that. Flip it over, do the other side. Any questions on doing that? Um, yes. Uh, um, Bo Harris asked, did you make your clogs? Um, I started with blanks, so the, the foot hole was cut out from them. Uh, a friend of mine in Holland sent them to me in the Netherlands. And then I carved the outside and did a little bit of work carving the inside to make them fit my foot exactly the way I wanted them. Uh, that's one of the nice things about clogs is you can carve them to fit your foot precisely so that there's no pressure points. And that's what makes them incredibly comfortable. And on top of all that, very protective. And loud. And in the way when you're trying to wash laundry. <laughs> uh, I'm in the basement shop. And so anytime I go upstairs, I take my shoes off so I'm not walking on the carpet with my shoes. So I want something I can just slip on and slip off. Well, I used to have, um, I used to have uh, slippers or um, sandals, but then a lot of people started complaining that I had sandals in the shop and didn't have protective feet. Um, so I got the clogs, and I really like the clogs. Yes, and you love to leave them in the entryway so your wife. I leave them in the same place every time, just because you haven't gotten used to them yet. They're this big. They're like a quarter of me. <laughs> He's trying to kill me. Yeah, I want all that insurance money. Yeah. <laughs> you can have the children by yourself then, too. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, so, there. Now we have our tin in, and we're ready to make a mortise. Now, I, I was originally planning on just making the mortise and tenon ahead of time because I just did the video on making a through mortise and tenon. But there's a few basic things that are different between making a through mortise and tenon and making a housed mortise and tenon, um, okay. as we're going to be doing here. Can you refocus that camera? It's Is that one not focusing? Fuzzy. Fuzzy. Sorry. Fuzzy, fuzzy. Here, i got to tilt it down to focus this one because this one i got to have something. It's not bad. It just... There. That's about as good as I can get it right there. It, that's a little better. Okay. Oop. Um, there's a few things that are a little bit different uh, when making a housed tenon um, that you just want to take care of. And I actually find making this uh, more <laughs> difficult. I find it easier to make a through tenon than to make one that is blind. So um, just like making the tenon, oh. we now need to make a hole in this. And we want to make it the same width as our mortising chisel. So we're going to do the same trick again to lay out the mortising chisel, set that down, and focus the camera in. There you go. One, two. And so I'm going to set this down, and I'm going to put it eh, right here. Normally I'd have layouts of exactly where this needs to be measured out for whatever else, but I'm just doing this into a cheap block. So once I have that in place, I can loosen up the mortising gauge, and then I can set these marks right into those marks I just made to make sure that they're all the exact same spot. Makes it really easy to slide that fence up against the side and then tighten it up. Just need to move it over here off the bench so that I can get at that thumb screw. Now that they're tight, I can check and make sure we're good to go. So let's cut this one. There's the width of our mortise. Now we need to lay out the length of it. So I can set this on here and I'm just going to put the actual tin on here and know 
that this needs to be that width. And that way I'm not measuring anything and trying to transfer any information. I know now that this marked out area is exactly the same as this. Now here I'm going to give you a, a slightly different question here that I, I, I think I answered last time but I wasn't quite sure. And I've had a lot of people ask me, should I use a regular bench chisel or should I use a mortising chisel? Um, if you have a mortising chisel, use a mortising chisel. I find it much easier, much stiffer, um, a, a simple tool to use, and it, it's, it's designed for mortising. It does really well at that. If you don't have one, then use a bench chisel, and they do just as well. The only problem with a bench chisel, you have to be careful of uh, wedging, of um, levering out the chips. You might run into the chance of um, bending the chisel, which isn't a great thing. Um, isn't a great thing. So um, I have a mortising chisel that's a quarter inch wide and I really enjoy it. So that's why I, this time I'm gonna use it. Um, last time I used a regular bench chisel so you can actually see both if you wanna see that. Um, before we do that, I have to lock this thing down. So I'm going to use a hold fast here. And for the hold fast, uh, grab this mallet, a couple good taps and that block isn't going anywhere. So um, let's get back to this and show you what we're doing here. One, two. Now for mortising, I find it easier. Where is my other mount? Oh, it's over there, I'll just use this one. Um, so I don't wanna put it right in the line. I actually wanna move it away from the line a little bit. And then I want to, wow, I just about did it this way. I don't wanna do it this way. When I turn it around so that the bevel is away from the line because you're always gonna travel in the direction of the bevel. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I had it turned around like that. That would have been fun. Um, but what this allow you to do is allow you to cut deeper and deeper with each plunge. So I'm gonna put it in there about an eighth inch or so away from that line. Set it, tap it, back it up, move it uh, an eighth inch or so. Another tap, lever out the chip, move it another eighth inch or so and continue on down. And as we get, each time we'll get deeper and deeper and deeper as we go back and soon I'm going to be down to almost the depth that I want. Now to find out the depth, I have this beautiful depth gauge that I got at the Pacific Northwest <coughs> Tool Collectors meet this year. And all it is is a rod sticking through a block. And so if you have a small block of wood, you can put a rod through it and just get friction fit. But this is a nicer, beautiful piece. So I can set it on here and know this is the depth of the tin. Now, because we're doing a wedge tenon, it's fairly important that the bottom of this actually be precisely the same depth as this. If I'm just doing a regular tenon where I don't care about the bottom of the mortise, um, I'll actually take the mortise a good bit deeper than the tenon so that the tenon, nothing's actually touching here on the bottom. But for a wedge tenon, I need the bottom to be just touching or ever so slightly shy of touching. So I need to make sure that my depth is correct. So that's why I'm going to be using a depth gauge on this. So we're gonna keep on traveling back. Chop, boom, chop, boom. And we're working down to depth. When I guess I'm getting close, then I'm gonna check it with the depth gauge and see how we're doing. Any questions while I'm doing this? And I'm just eyeballing this chisel being vertical. After you've done it a few times, getting the chisel vertical is pretty easy. Let's see how close we are to depth here. Okay, about a quarter inch more. So probably close to the time I get to the other side. Any questions while I'm hitting this? Uh. <coughs> you always ask for questions and then you make noise. Well, that's what I do. I know. Oy. Uh. So let's see, Matt as a lat says off topic. But what makes a firmer gouge different from other gouges, and what specific use do they have? A firmer gouge? Oh, oh um, clarify me. Unless you're talking about a firmer chisel, which a firmer chisel is just a, a beefier chisel, generally tends to have flat sides on it. Uh, though it's one of those terms that different people are going to say refers to different things. So it's kind of an ambiguous term. Although some people are going to say a firmer chisel is this or a firmer chisel is that. It's a great way to start arguments. Um, firmer chisels are for when you really want to move heavy things. Um, I like them actually for pairing. I, I, um, I, I am not a huge fan of dainty pairing chisels. I want my chisel, my pairing chisels to be beefy. Um, 
but I don't have any that I would actually call a firmer chisel. Now here I'm getting close to this other side, and I want to stay away from that line, because when I, when I go all the way down in and pull out, I'm going to be leveraging against this point here, and I don't want to crush these fibers back against that line. So I'm going to pull it up just a little bit. This will allow me to pull out those chips. So leaving that little bit of material there is going to give me something to leverage against. So let's see how deep we are here. Hey, we're getting close. Let me just make sure that that hasn't moved. Nope. Okay, good. All right, so I'm like a sixteenth inch away from depth. So now, rather than going this way, I'm going to turn the chisel around and I'll back it up a little bit and start working in the opposite direction. This will allow me to take it down a little deeper. And I think in the next one we're going to be at depth. And then once we get to depth, I'm just eyeballing it to make sure that we stay. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for right there. It's just scratching the bottom of that. And so from here on out, I'm just making sure I stay at that depth. Cool. Um, and if you have another, a smaller chisel, it's sometimes good for getting in there and cleaning out the chips that are down at the bottom. And blowing out so we can go on. <coughs> cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Hang on. Every time. That's what I do. I'm here for you, babe. <laughs> um, phrasing, yes, I'm 13. What's that? Oh, you're reading. <coughs> right, let me just check this depth. It went a little too deep, but not bad. About a, what, 32nd of an inch away from the bottom at one point. Um, so, before I move on to that, now that we have basically the two sides of this are coming in an angle and I have about three quarters of an inch at the bottom that's all the right depth. So rather than keeping this with bevel out here, I'm actually going to turn it around, put the chisel at a bit of an angle until I get this into a vertical line. Down like that. I think one more and we'll be cutting this pretty close to vertical. And I'm still staying away from that line. So now I've got a sixteenth of an inch or so back to that line. I'm going to see if I can split that in half. Go vertical again. And we're going to do it again. Put it right into that line. Yeah, I'm going to have to do it right into that line. Keep it vertical. All the way down. I'm going to reach in and clean out. What you got, babe? All right. <coughs> Uh, 3112 Design Co. asks, are you going to restart those large saws behind you? Um, oh, yeah, the, the two, um, I have uh, two big cross-cut saws, which, yes, um, this one basically just needs to be sharpened. Um, this one I have to do a little bit of cleanup work on sharpening. I'm going to do a couple of videos actually showing how to sharpen them. Um, so that should be a fun project. And I have a, I actually have a, Okay. Um, a woods Question. cleaning project where I want to use them. So, please what? talk away, talk away from the mic. Um, are Sorry, I get down close and I'm talking right into the mic here. Okay, but which camera do you think you're on right now? The main one. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yep, it's better for answering questions and seeing what's around. Right, right. What's that? Um. <laughs> what? Keep pounding. Well, I'm waiting for you to say something. I stop. German Woodwork asks, for your hold fast, you took three quarter inch holes. I'm assuming he's, he's yeah. clarifying. Okay. I don't have three quarter inch in Germany and 20 millimeters I think is too big. Three quarters is 19.2 millimeters. Any tips? Uh, no, 20 would be just about right um, for a three quarter inch hold fast. That's, that's pretty close. They don't have to be precise because the, the shaft isn't three quarter inch. It's like a sixteenth inch smaller than that. Um, so it's like a millimeter, it's what, two millimeters smaller. Um, so it's got a good bit of play in it because you want to have it wobble, wobble around. So a 20 millimeter would be just about right. Um, yeah, the, the hole needs to be a good bit larger than the shaft. 
And there is a lot of play in that, so. Okay, almost there. This one's running down vertical. I'm gonna go right into the marking gauge line on this one. And we'll run down vertical and we'll be just about there. Oop, that slid over just a little bit to clean that up. Okay, now we wanna actually treat this like a regular mortise and make sure it fits. And unfortunately, I think I'm gonna have to pair this one out a little bit. <coughs> but for blowing out, it's easier just to get your mouth down there and get really nice, clean, throw chips everywhere. You always have someone else come over and you say, here, look at this really closely. And it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so let's see, how close are we to this hole? Wow, that's actually really close. One, two. Um, rarely do they actually go right in. And I think I have a little bit at the bottom of this. Yeah, at the bottom, this actually pairs in. So I'm gonna get this, just clean out the bottom here a little bit. On both sides. And we should be just about right. Make sure we're at depth all the way across. There, got it. Now let's see what we've got. There. So now that's ready to actually start doing the wedge work. I'm going to pull this out nice and tight. Uh oh, pop out here. My holdfast is sliding. Well, not the holdfast. The holdfast is staying right, but. Uh... Yeah, a lot of people think that the hole for the holdfast needs to be exactly the same size. Um, and I had a question a while ago. A guy said, my holdfast came in wrong size. My holdfasts are about a 16th inch too small. And all my holes are three quarter. What do I do? And I was like, well, that's the size they need to be because they actually need to be able to twist inside that hole. So, yep. The problem of getting a really nice tight tenon fit is it takes a good bit to pull it out. Okay, so we've got our mortise and we have our tenon, really nice tight fit. Now we need to make wedges for this. So let's actually cut some holes, uh, some slots for the wedges. And I talked last time about not putting in re uh, relief holes in the bottom because a lot of people really think you have to have relief holes. Um, they're a nice thing to have, but there is absolutely no need for them. Uh, especially if you get close to the outside um, and you have a, a thin amount of material for it to uh, to flex on. Uh, back to this. So I can get my saw out here. Actually, I'm going to grab a different saw. This one has a thicker plate and a thicker plate makes it easier to get a wedge started. So I'm going to start out here. About uh, eighth inch or so in. Wow. Oh, that's right, this is the one I've never sharpened. I just bought it. And the teeth on it are really aggressive. So I'm gonna cut that down. Do the same thing on this side. And there's our slots ready for our wedges. <sighs> Any questions while I find this piece I'm looking for? Yeah. You got a I'm hair in your mouth. I'm disappointed, speaking of hair, that no one noticed I got my hairs trimmed. You got your hair trimmed? Yes, he, mm -hmm. he didn't oh. even. I even told him. Oh, that's right. You said you were going to do that when you took the kids running. That's I haven't even looked yet. Sorry. That's the love I get. Anyways, yes. I love you, babe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good thing I treat myself to my own hot chocolate Alan bought me at work. If anyone has a, uh, a <laughs> nice couch I could use tonight, uh, please let me know. Um, anyways, let's see. Joseph, no, yes. Joseph Bailey said, what is the minimum size of a workbench you can use to do small items? Oh, tiny. Um, I know guys that use a, a tabletop workbench. I'm just planing this piece down so I have a nice smooth piece to start with. Um, they'll use a tabletop workbench that's actually designed in for like apartments 
that they can put on top of their table um, in the apartment. And the, the table, the bench top is like 18 inches by 18 inches, and that's their working surface. Um, so you really don't need much. And I would say 99% of my work is done within about a one foot by one foot on the corner of this bench. Um, that's, that's where most of the work gets done. Um, two foot by two foot, and I could probably do 95 to 99% of the work I do can be done on a two foot, two foot by two foot space. So let's make some little wedges here. Back this up a little bit. Make sure I'm pointing at the right thing. There we go. And give you that view. So for the wedges, I'm just going to grab a chisel and a mallet, and I'm going to go down about an eighth inch or so, something right there. And I'm just going to try and see how the grain on this goes. And the grain on this is really straight, so it's going to be a while before I run out. And it kind of runs out into that infinity splinter. So I'll flip it over, and I'm going to plane it down. Now, I don't want this to come to an infinitely small space. <coughs> I actually am going to look at this here, and it's, it's nothing here. It's about a sixteenth inch here, and then it's about an eighth inch here. So wherever it's that saw curve, I'm going to cut it off at a straight edge. So about the thickness of the saw curve, something around there. And then I can test it in this and make sure that it fits. So yeah, that's right about where I want it. Then the next thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I cut it off at the right length. I want to make it ever so slightly shorter than the length of my cut. And so if I put it in here, if I had it full length in here and there was any issue, I could actually end up driving it into the body of the wood. So I want to stop it a eh, sixteenth inch or so short. Just a couple millimeters. I'm just going to mark it. That's how long I want this to be. Set it on here. Set the chisel on here. Put it <coughs> mark. And then I'm going to hold this with my <laughs> finger because I don't want this piece to fly away. Here. Oh, you guys can't see what I'm doing. Sorry. Let me do that. So I'm going to hold this on here so that piece doesn't fly away. One finger on there. And then I'm going to tap, tap, slice this off. And I'm going to set that wedge apart. And then I'm going to pare this down again. And I'll be able to get a second wedge out of this. And I find pairing with this chisel just a little bit faster than doing it with a plane. Let's clean this down to about a saw blade saw curve thickness. So, and then Cody K reminded to cut the. Okay. Yep, I'll do that when we, after driving this in. Okay, there's that. So let's mark you to length. Set that on there. Mark it to length. Whoa. What did I do? What did and there we go. And then cut that off. Do? do the same thing again. Whoa, whoa. What'd you do? I Do you want me to come look at it? Just give me a second. Oh, you've got so many things running in the background. Uh, I've got almost nothing running in the background. What are you talking about? What <laughs> is this thing that I just And then we want to thin these no, down. Because you can see they are the wrong width here. You okay? Do you need me to come look at something? Hang on. Okay. So you can see here they are too fat here. And the initial problem that we ran into is that they won't fit into the slot. So what I can do is put them on here, check them to this, and then I'm going to put this chisel right into there. And that's the size they need to be. So the same thing again, hold it with my finger, just give it a light tap. And theoretically, that should be the right width to then fit into this mortise. And so that one's good. Do the same thing again with this one. Earlier, my problem was that I um, I estimated their width and did not check them, so I cut them off. I cut them off a little bit too big. Put again, put the finger on this piece, otherwise it's going to fly away. How do you know that it's going to fly away? Because it has done that before on me. <laughs> and this one is really close, so let's clean this off. So again, we're going to pull 
this bench out here and plane it down very carefully not to take a finger off. Check it on there and we're ready to go. So just like we did before. So for right now, oh wait, we haven't paired this out. So you can always use this dry. You can slide it in and out like this and it comes in fairly easily because these can spread spring together. So if you're gonna do your dry fits, do your dry fits now. But the next thing we wanna do is we wanna take this mortise, the, side, the walls of this right now are parallel and we wanna actually flare them out at the bottom. So to do that, this is basically where the eyeballing comes in, a little bit of experience. I don't want to keep the chisel vertical. I want to <laughs> angle it at about what looks like the right angle to the wedge. And I'm just going to eyeball this. Wedging out the bottom. You see that's a little too steep. So I'm going to come back here and just pair out. And I wish I could show him this, but it's something that's really hard to even see. And with the camera, it's almost impossible. So I've got that one wedged out, and I just want it to be, I'm just taking off the thickness of this wedge, so the, the, the fat end of this wedge, that's all the amount I'm removing. So it's really just a couple shavings. So I'll give it a, a place to start here, <coughs> and then I'll tap, tap, tap it down. Just like that. Well, where did that come from? That's about all we need right there. Make sure you drop the wedge on the ground and don't see where it went. And there. So the bottoms of this are actually flared out just a little bit. It doesn't take much at all, just a few whacks with the chisel. Actually, I gotta clean out just a little bit. I can see back in here. And it's there really isn't a good way of saying this is the way you need to do it. I mean, if you did set up a specific angle to that wedge, then you could set up your, your angle finder on here and set this where it needs to be. But um, in all honesty, most anyone can do this with just an eyeball. <sighs> Make sure you're where you want to be and when it's ready to go in. And the nice thing about this is there, wood flexes, wood moves. Wood is not stagnant. It's not like steel and it gets to a certain point it won't move. If it's too tight, it will compress the fibers in here and it will crush things down. You're going to be putting a decent amount of pressure into it. Uh, so if you're off by a little bit, then it's not a huge issue. And if the, the slot in the bottom is too big, then it's not, it, it's not an issue as long <coughs> as the top of the slot captures this and the bottom of the slot is bigger so that this is fatter won't come out. This just has to be bigger than the slot opening is to stop it from coming out. So now we can put these in here. Slide this all into place and you just have to be careful. And you can see how they're in a little ways. I want to put those in there until they touch the bottom of the mortise. Should be right about there. And then we can very carefully start tapping it down in. And from this point on, it's locked. I can't get that out of there. This is, this is now an integral piece. This is some, not something you can come back from. So you wanna make sure that everything is good before you get there. So when you drive it down nice and tight, you have a really tight, clean line all the way across. So now let's actually take a saw and cut this down and see what's inside of this. I'm actually interested to do that because I've never done that on this one. This one's going to have a little bit of space in the bottom because I, I cut it a little bit deeper than it should have been, but uh, we will we will play with that. So any questions while I'm setting this up to cut it? Um, yeah, hang on. Oop, let me switch over to this one. <coughs> Mary Dune says super noob at mortise and tenon, but how bad is it if you chisel the mortise too deep? Uh, it's not. Uh, well, with a standard mortise and tenon, the bottom of the chisel, the bottom of the mortise does not have to be precisely flat. Now you're going to have the machinists out there who say the bottom of the tenon has to be the bottom of the mortise has to be perfectly smooth and perfectly flat so you have a good gluing surface. That is totally worthless because you have end grain on the end of the uh, uh, on the end of the tenon. That, that glue joint is, 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 is worthless. It's not going to do much of anything. Um, so having the bottom perfectly flat and perfectly the right size is, is, is a joke. Um, don't, don't listen to them. Um, now in this case, you do want the bottom to be flat because uh, you do want the bottom to be the, close to the same depth because the bottom is what actually drives the wedges up into the block. 
So when we cut this apart, you're actually going to see some gap in the bottom of this um, because this one I cut a little bit too deep, but not that far off, so it should be kind of interesting here. So let's actually slice this in half and see what we get. Tighten it down a little bit. Because I'm actually really fascinated to see what this looks like. see if I can eyeball and make these lines actually meet. That's a dangerous thing to do. Okay, meet on that side. Flip it around, make it meet on the other side. We should have a nice clean cut-ish, clean-ish cut. Here, I'm going to zoom in on this so you guys get to see it the first time I get to see it. I don't like hiding mistakes or problems, so you get to see how this actually looks. Let me just change over the camera, though. I'm actually kind of excited for this. Thank you for giving me the idea, whoever that was. So here we go. Let's open it up and see what it looks like. Yeah, there was a bit more of a gap on the bottom of this one. So here you can see... I was at the right depth here, but then I cut everything down here to the wrong depth, and I kept de cutting deeper here. And you can see how the, the, the space in here actually wedges out a bit. Uh, but the bottom needs to be able to push these up in here. And you can see if I, if I had the bottom up at this height all the way across, I would have been able to get the wedges up in here. Maybe I'll cut the other one apart and see what that one looks like. So your mama wants to know, she was late, would you glue it? Nope, no glue. Uh, here, let me zoom in a little bit more on this so you can see, oop, this way, up, there we go. So you can see that a little bit better. So I'm going to cut the other one apart and see what that one looks like, too. So any questions while I set that one up? Yeah, hang on. <coughs> Let's see, Matt as well asked, concerning hand saws and milling my own lumber after I've already fallen the tree, what's a good saw for cutting my lumber out of the tree? Quarter saw, if it matters. For cutting it out of a tree? Um, the Rebo style frame saw, so this big thing hanging up, um, it's basically a small pit saw, which is designed for a pit saw is what you would traditionally would have cut lumber out of a log with. Um, so something small like this, you can stand the log up and then cut your boards out of it. Um, a lot of work, but it can be done. Let's cut this off and slice that down. Slapdash cutting. <laughs> cool. What else we got? Um, Ken Ward from Saturday's Wood Shop. Please name a typical application for this joint. Um, any place where you'd have a mortise and tenon and you don't want to show the joinery and you want to do a, a more traditional method, this would be a good one. Um, this is a, a fairly common Japanese <coughs> joint. The Japanese really like to hide the joinery. They don't like showing that off. They like things being as simple on the outside as possible. Uh, so if you're doing Japanese woodworking, this is something you do quite a bit. But basically anywhere you have a mortise and tenon and you don't want the joint to ever come apart, this is a good one for that. Now I'm getting excited. I want to see what this other one's like. <laughs> oh, that was a bad cut. Oh, well. Here, I'll show you how bad that is. One, two, this one. My, uh, my saw went a bit skew. This side, it's nice straight up and down. I balled that one. This side, no, it went way off that way. So now I got to make those match. But we can do it. Uh, that's what I get for cutting so fast and loose. Oop, tighten that up. What else we got? Uh, 
Uh, let's see, Raven's Path. Any suggestions on board thickness for five foot shelves? <clears throat> we'll be making mortise and tenon legs. Um, shelves, I mean, three quarters, a really good size. As long as they're not like longer than, they're not spanning more than like three foot and covered with books. Um, I don't know if I would do much more than that. But three quarters, a really nice size. Three quarters is the, the size that is kind of a flexible, um, it gives you the strength, but it's not so fat that it looks like it's trying to be heavy duty. But I mean, it all depends on what you're planning on putting on it. <laughs> I mean, if you're storing half of the Library of Congress, then you probably want something thicker. But for average use, um, three quarters about right. So now because I cut that off at such a weird skewed angle, I'm going to have to split this one apart. So I'm interested to see if this, oops, let's do this again, two, see if this breaks anything. There we go. Well, I actually cut that one a bit too deep too. That's actually surprising. I didn't think so. A little bit more level than the other one was. Um, but uh, a little bit better fit. You can see how these wedge off and have a nice tight joint here. And honestly, getting glue on the bottom and glue, getting glue here on the side really doesn't matter because you have this end grain that's not going to hold very well. What's important is the long grain to long grain, so the sides of the, uh, the mortise that it fits into. So that's kind of fun. Uh, thank you for the idea of cutting that apart. I might have to do that with some of the other ones. It's kind of an interesting thing that might make a good, uh, um, a good thumbnail picture. We'll just see. Cool. What else we got? Oh, we got lots. Okay. What? Sorry, I've been talking too much tonight. Lives lives. Does the bevel on a mortise chisel need to be flat, or can it have a slight curve to it, or does it not really matter? Doesn't really matter. Um, you're going to talk to the purist out there and say, it's got to be perfectly flat, because it's a chisel. No. Um, and if you go to a lot of, you look at a lot of the old chisels and things, um, as they'd be sharpening it, their hand would move, <coughs> and so you get kind of a rock to it. Um, very common with even regular bench chisels to have that bevel to have a bit of a curve to it. Really not going to make any difference in functionality uh, because you're not using the bevel to reference off for making cuts. Um, so you can make it whatever way you want. But yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> What's next? All right, Sylvain Gregor. I don't know. Um, so did you use this type of tenons for the dining table you made? No. Um, the dining room table I just made, almost all the joints in that are half lap or edge lap. Um, so they're basically, the boards just lap across each other. Um, and so they'll actually be um, mating laps that run into each other. Um, and it's, it's made that way so that the whole thing can come apart. Um, because every, uh, every piece in the base can come out and the whole table can flat pack for shipping um, or moving, as we are tending to do. <laughs> Though not right now. Don't, don't say that right now. <laughs> What's next before I get my, myself into a hole? <laughs> Nathan Fain says, I don't recall seeing you use a pig seeing you use a pig sticker before. Is that new? Pig sticker. Um, a pig sticker is another name for a mortising chisel, though you're going to talk to people out there and know, say a pig sticker is actually a specific type of a mortising chisel. Um, honestly, you're getting into semantics at that point. Um, but a, a pig sticker. Uh, no, I have, I have several of them. I have an eighth inch, I have a quarter inch, I have a half inch. I think I have a three eighths. Um, I don't use them that much because a lot of people don't have them. And so most of the time I'll be showing off how to use a bench chisel because uh, in all honesty, they cut just the same. Uh, just a, a mortising chisel feels better because it's more stout. When you hit it, there's like a really nice connection feel to it and um, feels good in the hand. So if you have them, great, but they're harder to come by and they are more expensive. So I don't always show them out. Otherwise people are like, oh, I don't have one of those. I can't do that. Well, yes, you can. Bench chisel just does, just does just as fine. All right, um, Tim BBQ, do you ever drill a hole at the bottom of the slot to prevent the wood from splitting when driving the wedges tight? No, if I cut the wedge close to the outside, there is absolutely no fear of it splitting out. The, wed the wood is plenty flexible. If I were to cut it into the inside, and I showed this on my last wedged video where I had a wedged through tenon, 
um, how to move the wedge from being out at the outside of it, how to move the wedge inside. You can drill a hole to move the force towards the outside. Um, but drilling a hole at the bottom to stop splitting is, um, it's actually a fallacy. <coughs> um, it's common to do in glass, um, in ceramics, and in plastics where you want to stop this, this, the crack from spreading because if you drill a hole at the bottom, then the force from the crack will go all the way around the hole. Well, wood has grain, and putting a hole in it to stop the crack is, is a joke because the grain is only going to split out at the bottom, so all that force is still down at the bottom. So putting a hole in there is not going to stop it from splitting out. Um, what it can do is move the force over to the side, and if you want to see what I'm talking about, go watch the other video where I had the wedge tenant and I talk about that. So there really isn't a huge issue, it isn't a huge need for putting a hole at the bottom to stop splitting. If your, if your mortise was cut right and it's tight up here at the top of the mortise, you're not going to have any problem with it coming out. That was really cool. Cool. What else we got? Um, let's see. No. Andrew McCarter, James, I have not had the best of luck planting red oak with my Stanley. It does great on pine, and I think it was walnut. Is it me, or is ro red oak difficult to plant? <laughs> um, if you're talking about the difference between pine and oak, or most any other hardwood, yes, um, pine uh, red oak is far more difficult. It is um, it is fractious. You have to pay far more attention to the grain. Um, it's still easier than white oak. White oak is harder and even more fractious. Um, so you have to pay even more close attention to the grain and, and play with it. Um, your blade has to be sharp, and you're going to say, yes, it is sharp. Um, it can always get sharper. <laughs> um, and it's, it's not something I can, I can really show you other than having you feel one of the planes that I've just sharpened. Um, it's kind of a, a thing to do. But yes, red oak is much harder to, to work with than pine. Um, for most things like that, if you talk about working with a card scraper, no, red oak is far easier to work with a card scraper than pine. Um, but for um, planing work, yes, more, much more difficult. All right, Steve <coughs> does, no, oh, I'm sorry, guys. Steve does stuff as the amount of work you do on that corner of the bench, would it be better to put in a leather topper? No. Leather would absorb impact. Um, having the, the hard surface here is great. Um, if ever I wear out too much on the surface, then I'm just going to get a plane and resurface the whole top. And I've got a whole new surface to work with. So, And if I ever go through four inches of surfacing, um, then I'll make a new bench, and it'll be a long way down the road. Um, oh, we got to do giveaways. Um, we got to do some giveaways. So I'm going to be giving away two strops again. Um, and so the first question I'm going to ask for those who are live is, what type of wood is this? So I'll set that over here. And so you can go ahead and post that into the comments right now. And the first person who posts the right type of what type of wood is this will win a strop. Zoom that out a little bit more. And uh, for those who are not watching this live, mahogany? nope. Uh, for those of you who are not watching this live, uh, we're going to ask the question of how many strops have I sold thus far? Um, so as of uh, right now, how many strops have I sold? And the person who gets the closest with the answer next week, you will win uh, one of the strops. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing that. Let's see, what kind of questions do we have going in? Um, one, one, there we go. Uh, maple, ash, ash, salted maple, hickory, ash, ash, hard maple. Beef, hard maple. maple, there's the right answer. I have to go with Steve that. I can't give it to maple stuff. because you have to go with that. Steve does stuff. Um, I made the decision ahead of time. I'm not going to accept maple because I do have several other soft maples. Um, but this is a cool piece of a little bit of spalting and some bug damage. Um, I'm looking forward to using it sometime. So Steve does stuff. Um, send me inf uh, Okay, well, send hang on, email. hang on, hang on. What? But is spalted maple also correct? Because I think you need. No, I said ahead of time I wasn't going to do I wasn't going to do maple, so it had to be hard maple. Okay, but if they specified spalted maple, that's not correct. No, because they would have to say spe specified spalted hard maple. I'm sorry, Dwayne. Yeah, I know, I know. I was trying for. I you. thought about that ahead of time. I was like, no, I won't accept that. I won't accept that. So I was trying to get both of you to get one. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they like me more. But anyway. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, send me a contact on my website, woodbywrite.com, <laughs> and uh, give me your address. And if you want one with the logo on the top or the Which corner, I th think I have a few more of the top out there, um, and I'll send you out one of those. I'm actually sending out thirds 
Um, and so they, they're all missing like a corner. Um, so there's always a, a piece missing out of the thirds because I have a lot of these extra. Um, and these are far cheaper than the regular ones. The regular ones are, I want to say 14, 15 bucks a piece, uh, whereas these are 8.99. Um, so they're, they're exactly the same really thick horse hide um, and you can order one of those. So yes, um, and if you are watching this live and want to get in on the recorded session, about 10 minutes after we close this, you can go and put in your vote on that. How many strops have I sold thus far? Um, that should be kind of interesting. But don't put it in here. It'll have to go in the comments of the main video. Uh, let's see, two more questions. Um, no, it's going to be three because that's how many I have left. Okay, then we're going to do three questions. We're done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry if anyone else wasn't already on my list. Um, Kevin Rich asks, any suggestions for dimensioning lumber with knots or highly figured wood? Does he just go slow? Um, no. Um, the video I just put out on how to set up a smoothing plane, um, that's what you need. Um, you need to set up the plane within <laughs> an inch of its life. It's got to be sharp. The chip breaker has got to be close to the, the, the tip of the blade. The mouth has got to be small, and you've got to be taking small cuts. Um, all that put together and you can plane through the worst of wood. Um, so depending upon how gruesome and horrible the knots and um, grain is, depends on how tightly you have to set up the plane. If it's okay stuff, you can, you can loosen it up a little bit and take a little bit deeper cut. Um, but most of the time it's all about that fine tuning of the setup to get the plane dialed in perfectly. So if you want to see that, it's a video I put out, I think it was this last week. Um, how to set up a smoothing plane. And I have actually a couple versions of how to set up a smoothing plane where I go into that in detail. So, yeah. What's next? Um, Ryan Moffat uh, asked, uh, are, <coughs> sorry, are you not worried about splitting from the wedges without relief holes? Did we already ask that? Yeah, yeah we already asked, answered oh, that. Oh, I'm sorry. And then, Left blank. I'm deciding on how to make a dovetail box, but not sure how to do a bottom or top. Any recommendations? Um, I like a captured top, so putting in a um, uh, putting in a groove all the way around the the bottom, um, and then putting a, a bottom into it, so it's it's captured inside <laughs> that. Um, the nice thing about that is you actually get to practice with um, on two of the pieces. You can run the cut all the way through the board, but on the other one you have to stop it at either end. Um, unless you want to reverse it and, and be careful with how you come out the end of your um, um, your your tail. Um, and so it gives you the chance of cutting a groove with stop ends, which is kind of fun. And I have a couple videos on that as well. But it's basically like cutting a mortise, but it's only shallow and very long. Um, and a lot of fun. But yeah, uh, That's what I'd probably do is, is do a, a captured bottom and top and then saw the top off. So you're going to have four sides of the box, a bottom and a top, glue the whole thing, and it's a box that has no way of getting into it, and then cut the top off. Um, I, I, I like that look. It's simple, it's organized, and uh, it makes it uh, symmetrical. Uh, but there's a lot of other ways. That's just one that I really enjoy. So, is that the last one? Uh, I'm calling it the last one. Cool. Because I don't think I can ask anyone. Well, I don't have a joint in mind for next week, so if you have something you'd like to see me do, let me know. Uh, I have a couple fun ideas, but uh, we might do something different. So let me know your thoughts if you have anything particular. But I think that's about it for this week. Any fair and free? No? Um, I, I did a reminder about the hive mind because we seem to have newer people every week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to join uh, Wood by Right Hive Mind on Facebook, that's where I put some of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, it's really one of the best ways to get in contact with uh, fans and people and uh, see what all you're working on. And, give you some of the up-to-date ideas. So that's um, one of the best places to, to look at. But I think that's about it for today. Oh, now i got to find the button. Hang on. Uh-oh, here comes the button. She's going to look for it ahead of time this time. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> no more button race at the end.